The keystone to solving the valgus knee is to do correct match resection, that is to remove the thickness of the implant distally, posteriorly, and anteriorly from the intact side of the knee. And then the second most important issue is to correctly align the surface cuts on the femoral and tibial sides with reliable anatomic landmarks. The valgus knee is made valgus generally by collapse of the lateral femoral condyle. The tibia stays out of the anterior-posterior plane throughout the flexion and extension arc. The femur remains the keystone for alignment in the knee. The anterior-posterior axis still passes through the femoral head and is still perpendicular to the epicondylar axis in flexion and extension. Now let's look at this valgus knee. This is a typical valgus knee with a little valgus curvature to the femur. There's also deficiency in the lateral femoral condyle. There's some medial gaping in this knee. Now let's look at this knee a little bit closer. There's definitely medial gaping. We'll take a somewhat medialized entry point and we'll resect the thickness of the implant from the intact side using the medial side as a point of reference. The thickness of the implant has been resected from the medial side and in some cases nothing is resected from the lateral side. It should be emphasized here that this distal resection is based on the long axis of the femur. The long axis of the femur is used as point of reference for valgus alignment of the distal femoral cut. That makes the distal femoral cut parallel to the epicondylar axis and perpendicular to the long mechanical axis of the lower extremity that goes through from the femoral head through the knee and through the ankle. When we flex the knee we have a very similar situation. The lateral femoral condyle is collapsed. The medial femoral condyle is normal size and there's some medial gaping. The anterior posterior axis of the knee, which passes right down the center of the patellar groove and the center of the intercondylar notch, also passes directly through the center of the femoral head. That is a very convenient alignment landmark for valgus resection of the distal femur, that is, rotational alignment of the distal femur. If we make cuts that are perpendicular to this anterior posterior axis, they'll also be parallel to the epicondylar axis. That gives us a joint around which we can reconstruct the knee. So we draw the anterior posterior axis and then cut perpendicular to that anterior posterior axis, removing the thickness of the implant from the medial side. Much less than the thickness of the implant is resected from the lateral side. Then the tibia is cut perpendicular to its long axis. This leaves ligament contractures on the lateral side and the posterior flexion space is then made parallel by ligament releases, not by resection of bone surfaces. Now that we've released the ligaments, we now have parallel bone surface cuts on the posterior surface of the femur and on the upper surface of the tibia. This places the anterior posterior axis back in its normal position. It places the patella directly in the anterior posterior plane of the knee. It places the surface cuts of the knee in flexion parallel to the epicondylar axis and it corrects varus valgus malalignment of the knee in flexion. Now the long axis of the tibia is directly in line with the anterior posterior axis of the femur. It's also perpendicular to the epicondylar axis. The mechanical anterior posterior plane of the lower extremity now contains the anterior posterior axis and also contains the long axis of the tibia, as in a normal situation. If we use the posterior femoral surfaces for rotational alignment or varus valgus alignment of the knee inflection, here's what results. The AP axis is now tilted relative to the mechanical axis or the AP plane of the lower extremity. The patellar groove is medialized, requiring extensive lateral patellar release to place the patella in the correct position in the flexed knee. The joint surface is no longer parallel to the epicondylar axis and is no longer perpendicular to the anterior posterior axis and anterior posterior plane of the lower extremity. This is an example of an x-ray done using that technique, the posterior femoral surfaces for rotational or varus valgus alignment and flexion. The patellar groove is medialized and the patella has fractured and is now draped across the lateral femoral condyle.
When we extend the knee with this internal rotational malalignment of the femoral component, it's apparent that the patellar groove is medialized, the Q angle is excessive, and that the patella will track poorly. The patella normally wants to ride right along the lateral edge of the femoral condyle, and it will sooner or later seek that position if the femoral surface is malrotated internally. This is the same example of the knee shown previously in full extension. The femoral component is internally rotated, the tibia is correctly rotated. The patella is clearly subluxed laterally in extension as well. Now let's take a look at this clinical case. This knee has approximately 15 degrees of valgus, somewhat loose on the medial side. When we flex the knee, the patella is located laterally, but that's because of lateral collapse of the femoral surface. The entire femur is now tilted laterally relative to the long axis of the tibia and relative to the anterior posterior axis of the lower extremity. Let's draw that anterior posterior axis of the femur. The AP axis is constructed from a point on the lateral border of the posterior cruciate ligament and one in the deepest part of the patellar groove. When we connect these two points we have the AP axis and then a perpendicular to that which represents the epicondylar axis. It's clear that there is severe deficiency of the lateral femoral condyle. The femoral entry point is somewhat medialized, so is the tibial entry point. The alignment guide is inserted into the femur and then the anterior posterior sizing is done. It's very important to notice that the anterior posterior axis is used for rotational positioning of this anterior posterior sizing guide. That way we size the medial femoral condyle, the larger femoral condyle and not the smaller lateral. When we align the cutting guide it also is aligned directly with the anterior posterior axis. The anterior posterior axis can be seen through the slot in this cutting guide and the medial or lateral surface of this slot is aligned with the anterior posterior line we've drawn to represent the AP axis of the knee. The femoral cutting guide is then pinned in position so that its surfaces, the surfaces of the bone, are perpendicular to the AP axis. These posterior femoral surfaces are not reliable landmarks for positioning in varus valgus of the knee in flexion. These surface cuts are perpendicular to the AP axis, which places them parallel to the epicondylar axis. That leaves the knee still tight laterally and loose medially. We'll correct that both in flexion and extension with ligament releases. Now the distal femoral cutting guide is applied and the distal surface of the femur is resected. Oftentimes very little is resected from the lateral side and the full thickness of the implant is resected from the medial side of the knee. The posterior femoral condylar surfaces are being removed and when we look at these posterior femoral condylar surfaces, it's clear that we've corrected deformity. The lateral side is much thinner than the medial side. We've corrected valgus deformity in the flexed position. Now here we can see that the osteophytes are not easily accessible without tibial resection. The next step is to resect the upper surface of the tibia. Approximately 10 millimeters are resected from the upper surface of the tibia possibly a little bit less than 10 millimeters if the knee is somewhat lax on the medial side. First we make the surface cut, remove the posterior portions of the menisci, and finish off the upper surface of the tibia. The osteophytes are now accessible. Osteophytes tent the medial collateral ligament and they can be safely removed from the femoral side also from the intercondylar notch. The lateral femoral osteophyte is often prominent and tense the uh, popliteus tendon or lateral collateral ligament. It should be carefully removed and popliteus and lateral collateral ligament release should not be done yet. Posterior femoral osteophytes are also removed but the medial tibial osteophyte should probably not be removed because its removal can damage the medial collateral ligament. Now the trial tibial component is applied and it is applied so that it covers the upper tibial surface as best it possibly can. The polyethylene is inserted and the femoral trial is applied. It's adjusted medially laterally to conform to the contours of the distal femur. Now here it's very clear that the anterior posterior axis of the femur 
has been restored. The center of the intercondylar notch, uh, the center of the patellar groove are directly in line